So what are we doing about it? And what should we be doing about it? Um, I think the starting point is to accept the reality of the situation, and that is that organised crime has always been with us. I think it's said that prostitution is the oldest profession in the world, and if that's true, organised crime would be the second, because you could be pretty much assured that there would have been a pimp along pretty soon to start organising the prostitutes, and then almost straight away you're into organised crime. So it's been around for a long, long time. So I get nervous when, um, from a public policy point of view, we start talking about wars on organised crime. Because if you're into a war that you can never win and never end, then that's the war to get into. But the point I'd make is, you know, we are never going to get rid of organised crime. The issue becomes how do we control it? And what is an acceptable level of control for organised crime? And there are actually some tensions within that that I'll come back and talk about um, briefly in a moment. But in terms of what you do about it, I mean, the Minister mentioned the Commonwealth's Organised Crime Framework, and uh, I think, you know, that actually is uh, a, a good start. It's a good piece of work that the Commonwealth um, has undertaken in terms of trying to think about a framework for approaching organised crime. We went through a similar process here in Victoria back in 2003-2004, because in addition to dealing with the public manifestation of organised crime on the streets, we realised that we needed to think about our strategy and our approach so that the operational response by itself, that is the Piranha Task Force and all the great work it did, was never going to be enough to deal with this issue. And you have to start thinking about it in much more holistic terms. So we developed an organised crime strategy and there were six key pillars to that. Um, the first one was really about building up our intelligence capacity because what we worked out as an organisation is we knew a lot about organised crime. There was a lot we didn't know, but there was a lot that we did know, but we, we knew it in a very disorganised way. <laughs> So, you know, trying to join all of that up and trying to get a very complete picture as to the way organised crime works is part of the challenge. And then also, as I talked about earlier, working out what you don't know and how you actually fill those intelligence gaps is also an incredibly important part. The operational environment is obviously enormously important, and I'll say a little bit more about that later on. Anti-corruption, particularly from a law enforcement point of view, but also from the point of view of other public institutions, is very important because you know if you've got organised crime, that's where they'll go. They will try and infiltrate your organisations, they will try and compromise you every time. And so you have to have, as part of any sort of sensible strategy, a focus, a relentless focus on anti-corruption. And you can never let go because the moment you do, they'll be back in. Um, legislative. And again, the Minister talked about the continuing legislative reform that's happening here in Victoria, and I know it continues to happen in other jurisdictions because, of course, you need the right laws to actually be able to deal with the threat posed. Um, one that doesn't get a lot of attention but is very important is the regulatory environment and, and, and how you regulate. Now, there's a couple of examples of that. Um, I know in Ireland, in the, two, when, in the two islands, there was a change in the fuel excise being levied on fuel between, between either side of the border. And it actually created a marketplace for the IRA to move into and traffic fuel across the border because they could make money out of it. Now, who'd have thought? I'm sure the regulators didn't actually give that a minute's thought, but in actually setting up that regulatory regime, they created a marketplace for organised crime to operate in. There was a, uh, uh, an example here in Victoria, tobacco, that used to be grown in the northeast part of the state. And of course, with the amount of taxation that now gets applied to, or was applied to tobacco uh, here in Australia, it created a marketplace for chop chop, that is tobacco that was not properly you know, accounted for and then taxed through the Commonwealth scheme, it was actually diverted out of the market into the illegal marketplace. And it became incredibly violent. You know, Organised crime moved in, um, they were stealing it and there were wars and it was a really, really difficult situation for us. It was solved overnight. There is no more tobacco being grown in Victoria. Now, that's been done for other reasons, but again, the regulatory environment actually created a marketplace for organised crime to work within. And then the final part of the strategy is actually about communication. Because as I said, you know, we need to work hard to have the public actually understand the nature of the threat, to understand their role in it. Because if you're actually going to the tobacconist and buying cheap tobacco, what are you doing? You're actually participating in an organised crime market. But many people won't see it that way. You know, they'll just say, oh, well, good luck to me, I'm getting cheap tobacco, I'm not going to worry about it. So you know, the educative process is incredibly important. Um, 
as I say, the Commonwealth's organised strategic framework has its five capability area. I mean, I won't talk about that at length. I'm sure that will be covered over the course of the next couple of days. But it seems to me that's the sort of response that's actually required. Because if you just leave it to the cops, we'll do our best, but we're never going to succeed to the extent that we need to unless you actually have that holistic approach to, um, to the issue. Um, I did talk about the need to change the way we operate, and that's very definitely the case, because we do impact on organised crime. They learn from us all the time, and they change the way they operate as a result of what we're doing. So we just can't simply keep doing the things that we've always done and expect to be successful, because they'll have moved on and will have missed the point. So again, you know, there's been much said and much written about Piranha. At the end of the day, it's pretty simple. You know, there's no rocket science about it. It's a task force. It's a multi-skilled task force. It was multi-agency. We relied very much on partnerships with the Australian Crime Commission. We relied very much on partnerships with other law enforcement agencies and police organisations around Australia to get intelligence and to help us deal with this problem. Um, it was multi-skilled, so it was actually about bringing in expertise. You know, one of the smartest things we did is actually put some people in there who had fraud expertise. What would a fraud investigator know about a homicide? Not a lot. What would they know about organised crime? Well, they know a bit, but they sure know a heck of a lot about assets and how to trace money. And if you're dealing with organised crime, that's exactly the sort of expertise that you need. And in a way, that's how you ultimately hurt and damage organised crime. You take their money off them. And so the inclusion of fraud investigators as part of that task force um, has been very, very essential and helpful in dealing with the nature of the threat. So what sort of challenges lie ahead? Well, as I said, I think it's um, uh, foolish to think that we can totally eliminate organised crime. Um, we have to manage the problem. And um, this can be difficult in the sorts of countries that we live in. So in a stable democratic country, there are real challenges around that because, of course, you get into that constant argument around civil, civil liberties and, you know, public good uh, and how you strike that balance. Now, that's an age-old argument. It's not a new argument but it's one that plays out, um, again, in this area very significantly. I mean, we're seeing that at the moment with some jurisdictions moving to anti-association laws and those laws being contested through the courts very, very vigorously by the subject of those anti-association laws, in fact, going all the way to the High Court. Um, asset confiscation and forfeiture laws. Again, I think these are uh, an essential key to any sort of effective response to um, organised crime. And we've done a lot in that area, but perhaps there is more to do. And you do get to, um, you know, perhaps targeting unexplained wealth and unexplained wealth provisions and whether they're actually an effective tool. Well, clearly they're an effective tool. Absolutely they're an effective tool. But again, is it appropriate to actually have such a tool in a country like Australia? Um, and those things do need to be thought through very, very carefully because that's actually one of the risks from, for us. Um, one of the risks for us in, in dealing with this problem is not to get to such an extreme that we actually start to lose public confidence in what we're doing and public support for what we're doing. So that whole issue of legitimacy and credibility of the laws that are passed and then enforced is a real risk for all of us. Um, the way we operationalise those, those laws is a risk for us because if we misuse them, we'll lose them. They'll be taken off us. So it's one of those real conundrums where, you know, we're always, or there's a real tendency to want to run an argument for harder and more effective laws. And yes, there's very often very cogent and coherent arguments for that. But the balance always needs to be struck around proper regard and protection for civil liberties. But to me, the broader issue is around continuing public support for what we're doing. And the risk is as if we become too draconian, we lose public support, public confidence. And that in some ways poses more of a risk to us than anything else. So that's one of the challenges that we'll need to face up to. There are challenges in the way that we operate. Again, going back to the Piranha example, where one of the tactics we used very, very successfully was, in, in, in you know, police speak, was to roll crooks. Um, and again, if you're dealing with organised crime, trying to get to the heart of it, you won't get there very often going direct. You've got to actually understand the networks and work your way in. You've got to understand where the weaknesses are, where the weak individuals are, where the weak connections are, and target those, and then work your way in. And that's what we did. And in that process, you know, getting good, serious charges against good, serious crooks, 
um, putting them before the courts and then putting them in a position where they had a choice. Did they want to go to jail for 30 years or did they want to do a deal? And they'd do a deal. But this raises some really interesting ethical problems in terms of the nature of the deals that are done. And of course, more recently in Australia, there's been a federal court decision that's touched on this very issue um, involving the AFP and the extent to which we can and should be doing a deal with crooks in order to get them to roll as a means of having them testify against others. Um, and I think this is going to continue to be a very significant challenge and risk from a law enforcement perspective as we continue to deal with organised crime. So um, I am going to um, finish up now. Uh, as I say, I've, I've you know, necessarily stayed at a pretty high level and I'm sure many of the issues that I've touched on uh, will be dealt with in more detail over the next couple of days. But this is an important opportunity for us to come together and think again about this issue and we will need to continue to deal, do this because the nature of the problem is very real, it's very present and it's not going away. And if it continues to shift, then we've got to continue to challenge ourselves to think about how do we deal with this issue and how do we continue to change the way we work in order to be effective against organised crime. Because if we continue just to do the same thing over and over again, we're out of business. And so the challenge is a very, very real one for us. But it's one I believe we're up to. I think it's one in Australia where we are doing well. We can clearly do better, but we are doing well. But I think the next two days will provide a great opportunity for us to do a bit of a stock take, to hear from one another, to hear from other international experts about what they're doing, to share experience and to continue what does need to be a relentless fight against organised crime. It's not a war, but it perhaps is a fight. Uh, and it's one that we just need to stick at, even though, in a sense, you know, it, it, it never ends. And therein lies the challenge for us. So thank you very much again for being here. Uh, I wish you well over the next two days for your deliberations, and I very much look forward to seeing what comes out of the next couple of days. Thank you very much.